Godfather two to Godfather one. In fact, if if we we'll still like Godfather two, we'll do half of this in Italian. How about that? It had to be your half. <laughs> Three, two. Hello, and thanks for tuning in to Southeastern Fly. Before we get too far along, I want to ask you to go ahead and select subscribe, and that'll automatically put the each episode into your feed as they come out. You can follow us at uh, www.southeasternfly.com. We're on Facebook under Southeastern Fly, Instagram, of course, or you can join the Fly Fishing Podcast by Southeastern Fly on Facebook. That's a Facebook group, which is where we ran the poll to find out what people wanted to learn more about. And from that poll, uh, we found out that people want to learn about tailwaters, and voila, here we are. In this episode, we're going to talk about fly fishing tailwaters for trout, mostly. If you haven't listened to part one yet, you don't have to stop this episode. You can always go back and listen to part one. This isn't scientific. This discussion is more about real observations, things that we've seen, watched, watched unfold on the tailwaters. It's practical, hopefully useful. And we want to be able to transfer that knowledge to you, the listener. You may already know some of this information. Hopefully, some of this information will be new. Some may be a refresher to you. If I was listening to this, I would keep in mind and remember, there's no hard and fast rule for fishing any water or catching any fish. Matter of fact, if you show one fish to ten guides, they're probably going to catch that fish ten different ways. I wouldn't get too married to any of this information, but I hope that you can take pieces of it and use it in your, your daily fishing. Who's going to be joining us to keep this discussion going? Let's wel- welcome back a member from the Liars and Tires, a lifelong angler, watercolor artist of all things fish. He's got original paintings and limited edition prints, live from the banks of the Stones River. Ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> let's welcome Dan Charlie. It's great to be here, David. Thank you. This is part two, so this is like a sequel. So we're like The Empire Strikes Back to Star Wars or Godfather 2 to Godfather 1. In fact, if, if let's do like Godfather 2. We'll do half of this in Italian. How about that? It had to be your half. <laughs> <laughs> it ain't gonna be I did take Latin in high school. <laughs> I can do it in Latin <laughs> very well. Hey, before we get too deep into this, I've got a question. Yeah. You know our golden gingerly, the old older golden. So today is Ginger's birthday. Mm-hmm. With dogs, do you give them people ice cream for their birthday or do you go out and buy dog ice cream? My experience with dogs is if I could do it, I'd give them people ice cream every day of the year. Although that would probably make a pretty gassy golden rich or so I don't know if I'd do that but people ice cream is there such a thing as dog ice cream so I, I just finished eating and they were talking about it at the table of having ice cream I'm thinking that's exactly what I need to go with my mm-hmm. my uh, blender's dog talk about dog yeah. my Jameson blender's dog and, and vanilla ice cream probably be really good but I said why, why what kind is it and they said well it's dog ice cream they ran down the list of things that it tastes like like this one is cheese and something else and then they said cheese and bacon, which that almost sounds okay, but not for ice cream. That's more like for breakfast. Mm-hmm. I don't know. I don't know how I like that. I don't know. I guess maybe I'm just hoping for people ice cream, but I'm out. Happy birthday to Ginger. That's right. Though. 13 years old today. I don't know what. That's awesome. I don't know what that is in dog years. I'm not doing that. Man. 91. Really? Dang, you're quick. I don't know. Oh, shit. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Okay. All right, well, let, let, uh, let's, let's go. Let's, let's start out with what we talked about on the last episode. We talked about safety first, right? You can't do an observation from the tailwaters without a small piece, at least on safety, so be careful out there. We talked about trout being basic creatures with basic needs, such as, and I'm going to come back to these. I don't know if you remember, but I kind of got hung up on these four things the more I thought about. These are the things that I really look for when I'm on the water. Food, oxygen, temperature, and protection. Talking through the last episode... It brought it to the forefront that, hey, I really do look for these four things if I'm looking at a piece of water. Uh, we talked about wading versus floating. We talked about shoals and ledges, uh, stair steps. Here, here's the way I feel it, like the, the last episode went, Dan. I feel like we gave the audience a drink of water through a fire hose. I mean, mm-hmm. there was a lot of information in there, and it's like we just came in and kind of threw it all out there. Maybe this one we can slow down a little bit. Yeah, we did. We talked through a ton of stuff, uh, and that was over an hour, I think, full of information and just part of that uh, of what we really want to cover. If anything, it, it tells you how complex 
even in a tailwater system, which on the surface, pardon the pun, seems a little bit ordinary because it's just water that comes out from underneath the dam, but unlike a freestone river, but it's got the same complexity. They're just done a little bit differently because of the, the nature of generation. So it, there's a lot to talk about. So I think it's fitting that we're we're on part two and we did kind of open up the fire hose last time. I don't know of any other way really to make it informational. I'm, I'm sure that there's some eyes that are gla- going to glaze over uh, or have glazed over, but maybe that's, maybe that's a reason to go back and piece chunk it out, right? So you, you can kind yeah. of chunk it out into safety and, and the basic needs of trout and waiting versus floating. You, you use me as a guide. If my eyes glaze over and I start dozing off, that's a sign that it's track. <laughs> if you start talking Latin, that will, uh, that'll probably happen to me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, so the information in this episode is independent from the last episode. Like I said, it's built to being informative and useful on its own. That's why we've chunked it out this way. Here I go. I think I'm going to use chunk it out throughout the whole podcast. So Chunk it out. Chunk it out, David. Every time I say chunk it out, you drink. <laughs> Let's go ahead and start. So we're going to talk about several more uh, observations of different types of water and different types of structure within a tailwater. You can go out west and the tailwaters are totally different. The Madison, the tailwaters on the Madison are totally different than the tailwaters on the South Holston. They have a lot of similarities, but the gradient's different. The width's are different. The depth's different. The way that they run the the dam, the generation, is different. There are different needs for different dams. So keep that in mind. It's not a one-size-fits-all, but you should be able to take pieces of it and take it with you and be able to use it. I think this is this is the type of episode that I think folks could listen to on the way to the river. Maybe I want to think about scouting this morning. You know, I'm on my way to the river. So tailwater fluctuation in, in scouting. And scouting is important. It's an important part of fishing tailwaters, Dan, especially if you're going to fish tailwaters when they're lower and maybe when they're releasing a little bit of water. If it's a 10-foot swing, it doesn't quite come into play as much normally. If it's a two-foot swing, a lot of things come into play and stay in play. Low water, to me, is, is a good a good opportunity for you to, to learn a lot about um, a tailwater and, and what it has to offer. You can't always predict that, but hopefully you, you get a good enough generation schedule in advance so you can get there and understand what it looks like in low water. That's where you can scout conditions out and, and, and different aspects of the stream. It's a good time to watch fish behavior. Typically, the good thing about tailwaters is, is the water is fairly clear, so there is that opportunity with some polarized glasses and on a, on a good day you can observe what's going on with the fish. And thankfully with, with trout, they tend to rise if they're feeding. So you can always look for that as well. The, the careful thing with that, even with low water, is there's the tendency that all of us have is, especially if we're weekend warrior type fishermen, unlike you out there on the water a good bit, um, when I fish, it may be squeezed into, I have a little bit of time on a Saturday. And I know I'm going to fish below this dam and the water's off for a few hours. And you get there, the first thing you want to do is just run right into the water and start fishing. If it's the first time you've been to a tailwater, you might, or that particular tailwater, you're missing a great opportunity to look around a little bit first and scout and, and, and observe. So I think a, a big point that you're, you're, going, you're making with this is don't just charge in, look around a little bit and, and observe, well, one, what the water level is at the time. And if it's at low water, you can observe different types of structure from shelves to steps to shoals. They may be very visible at that low water stage. I agree. I might have, I may have met a handful of people on the river over however many years I've been doing this. Didn't offer up some information if, if, if you ask them, yeah. you know, like what color is working or you fishing nymphs, you know, don't, don't give me your favorite nymph, although I'll take it, right? I'll, I'll take that information, right. but I don't expect <laughs> it. I don't have that expectation that somebody's going to give that to me, but they'll get you in the, they'll get you in the general area. Yeah. If they say, if they say it's 18 midge, you know, okay, well fish a 16 and a, you know, a 20 yeah. also, you know, just to make sure that you're, you're hitting on both sides because some people won't give up every bit of information. Now, flip side of that is there are people that say, here, let me cut this off and give it to you. You fish this one. Here's yeah. what I'm doing. A lot of people will take the time to do that. And they want to, I don't know why it's just, maybe it's a friendly group of people. Maybe it's just folks like the same things that we yeah. like, whatever the reason is, you know, a lot of times you'll get some really good information and some really good help and some detail detailed help. Yeah, generally people want to help other people. So, I mean, it's, it's go for everybody, yeah. certainly. But on the river, there's a certain camaraderie that can come along there and, and people are willing to share. And then 
encourage the listeners if you're you're out there to to share what you can. I mean, give away your your favorite fly, your favorite spot, but you can you can talk generally about what you're doing and and help somebody yeah. out. I, I think you know we talk about you know getting into a tailwater too and. Um, and scouting it to a certain extent, there's a lot of fluctuation that can occur. I talked about low water. High water is is a difficult time to judge what's going on on the river bottom, but high water can also change the river bottom. That may be something you observe when you do do get there at low water. I mean, when I'm talking high water, I'm talking about heavy generation and or big rain events, which could move gravel bars, which I know we'll talk about later, or a tree that may have been a piece of structure that, that you had relied upon for the past couple of trips is now not there anymore because it's been moved downstream by current. So it's, it's another aspect before you get your boots wet, look around. It's funny. You said that I'd been fishing this same tree for weeks, probably months back there. It was a little bit warm actually. So yeah, it's probably been months and it was sticking way out in the river and they generated and now it's pushed up against the bank. And I was just like, dang it. Yeah. It was a great tree. You know, I love that tree. Now it's about it's pushed up against the bank, but now the fish are still laying beside it. It's just that it's yeah. it's now parallel, I guess, with the with the current and not sitting more or less across it. So there's really yeah. probably a little bit less structure, but uh, I don't know. It's still we still were able to catch some fish off of it. But man, I had to stop and go. All right, what's what exactly is going on here? You know, where did it go? Yeah. And it wasn't. It didn't just push it down. I mean, it pushed it downstream a little bit and to the side. It's amazing what the, what that water pressure can do uh, in moving stuff around. And you've experienced it too. Mm-hmm. I know in, in, dr- in the drift boat, I you know the stream so well, but you still have had periods where maybe you're getting there after some high water period. Then all of a sudden, the trees that you used to fish aren't there. But there's new trees and new trees that actually may be crossing the stream or providing opportunity to fish or, or, or providing an opportunity for you to get out and uh, have to figure out a way around it yeah you know that's funny you said that because there was a on a certain tailwater here in middle tennessee there was a a tree that stuck out across a corner across a bend a really hard bend and we'll talk about bends in a minute i came along uh after like months of heavy generation and it was gone i was like wow that tree's gone that's really good six months later i found it in the bottom of a hole uh about uh, probably a quarter mile downstream and a fish broke off and i told the the guy that's fishing with me he said, is there anything in that hole? And I was like, no, uh-uh, it's, it's, it's all gravel. And the fish, it was a big rainbow that ran down there and, and just wrapped around that tree or, you know, rubbed up against it and broke off. And I was like, crap, I can't believe that I didn't know that tree was there. I never had to look for it. You know, all I yeah. knew is in the spring it was gone and in the summer I found it the hard way that yeah. was a bummer but yeah you know i guess i guess well that's if i just scouted that area a little better i'd have known it but live and learn it, with that scouting and with it with you, know, you bring up the kind of where we were going next is as you kind of float down the uh, a river you're going to encounter things like holes and 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 what we're talking about holes is, is when you have a sudden drop in depth and typically you can find them after shoals and riffles that's kind of the pattern is is that there will be a shoal or riffle, and then there will be a hole followed by a run, which we'll talk a lot, uh, talk a little bit about afterwards. But holes can be unique parts of the river system, and they're there all, in, in tailwaters. In some cases, it can be very dramatic holes, or sometimes there will be fairly subtle ones. Uh, they can house the trees. They certainly can house uh, or keep a lot of fish and, and can be great places after you scout it out a stream starting off and understanding what the dynamics of that particular spot are in, in, in relation to a hole or where fish could be staging within. Typically a hole will, will hold fish for, for a few reasons. There's a bunch of reasons why let's, a few plus reasons, let's say. One, I think just like, I think this kind of goes back to the, the protection, the food, the oxygen, you know, that sort of thing. So there's protection. So it's a little deeper, you know, I think they yeah. feel a little more secure from, from birds, like the eagles and the ospreys and the, the herons and that sort of thing. Um, uh, a hole really is a good place for them to ambush their prey. If you think about maybe swinging a streamer over, over the front side of a hole, so where the water comes off, maybe a gravel bar rolls down into a hole or maybe off of a good shoal and it rolls down into the hole and it steps down. If you can run a streamer over that ledge of just the front side of that hole, maybe a foot or two foot in, you would be surprised at what you catch there. And I think that's an ambush tactic for them. They're Obviously, they're looking for whatever's fallen in there from you know from the current whatever the current brings in there i guess i should say but they'll ambush that prey they'll ambush that streamer of like think of a a small uh, forage fish or shad or something like that trying to keep itself going and gets into that hole the next thing you know i've seen big browns come up and just smash you know flies that are just swung right over the edge of that hole front the leading edge of the hole i guess is where i should say that's 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 place uh, so i think it, it provides ambush spot i think it's providing cover 
protection. And then there's, if you think about a hole, Dan, normally there's not one current going through, right? There's, there's a main current going through, but there's a lot of smaller currents within that main current that are doing a lot of different things, which that breaks up the water a little bit better. So they feel even more secure. Plus, obviously there's oxygen flowing through that current and some food. If there's a rock or a log or something like that, there'll be a back eddy in there that you might want to hit too. Yeah. They can move off the bottom and take that food. They can re- retreat back to the bottom of the hole. So they come off the bottom, grab it, go back down to the bottom. As they come up, you'll just watch where they come up and they'll come up in different currents at different times. And maybe that's, you know, maybe that's a, a midge floating through there and it's one current one at one time and there's another midge and another current. But knowing those currents will help you fish those. So watching them and understanding it's about observations that's why it's called observations from the tailwater and other reasons they'll have opportunities to come up at different spots you'll want to take that same opportunity to watch what they're doing you know is there a pattern if there's not then okay there's not but many many times there is you talk about the current going through there and you're right back eddies can form in those holes that can um, be an interesting dynamic of, of what looks if just from the surface again looks like a fairly still area of the stream i think nymphing helps a whole lot to understand where those current seams are and where it may be flipping back the other Mm -hmm. way at the same time you can and just where we're talking observations again look for things that may be floating on the surface leaves or just you know bugs even um you all of a sudden start seeing a you're watching a a mayfly go downstream on the surface uh spinner and then all of a sudden it starts going back up the other way you know there's there's some sort of feature within that current that's now forming an eddy there. And that's a great spot for fish to hold too. It doesn't always mean they're feeding fish, but you can guarantee there's probably fish in there at least resting. Uh, my experience with, with, with holes is you're right. The drop off to me has always been one of the more productive spots for me. It doesn't mean you won't catch fish along the rest of the hole, but uh, typically it's the drop off in the, in the tail end of the hole where you have more of your active fish in the middle, it may be fish that are either staging and waiting to feed, or it could be fish that are just kind of resting out and seeking cover from whatever predator they may, that may be in the area. You can observe it by looking at what's on the surface and then watching your indicator if you're nymphing. To me, it doesn't matter what you're fishing if you're if you're indicator fishing. My general rule of thumb is if you can mend your line and make that indigo, indicator go just a little bit slower than the actual current, I have a better shot at catching fish than if it's moving a little faster. Well, you're, you're an expert at this and you got tremendous patience when it comes to, to, to fishing, uh, indicator and depth through some slower water. Um, talk a little bit about, cause I, I'm going to pick your brain. I want to learn from you <laughs> often. Uh, I've wondered about that cause it's going through some water that if it's a hole and it's relatively calm water, if you want to call it that, there's still current there, but it's calmer certainly than than the the shoal or the or the riffle it just went through. Is it a matter of depth sometimes, or is it a matter of the drift speed that you're using there? You talked about going a little bit slower, but do you find that you've got to match the depth and go maybe very deep in terms of the distance between your indicator and a fly, or is it let the fish tell you? Let the fish speak to you. That'd be great if That's they would a lot that. of questions. That sure is, man. That was just, you ran right through about three good topics right there. Uh, so let's talk about pig alley on the elk, which some, most okay. people probably do. That's our, that's our term for a, a specific spot on the elk river. It's a long, I mean, extremely long hole. So the depth in that hole, if you think about it, it doesn't stay four foot d- deep or six feet deep or 10 foot deep. It bounces up and down so you're going through it's a big long hole but within that hole there are shoals deeper spots shallower spots there's rocks there's a lot of trees whole lot of trees down in that in that section which i can all the trees all the rocks all that thing i can go back to your your discussion earlier about water pushing up against that structure and and that's a good place for for fish to hold kind of like that pillow you know, like that push up against that mm. pillow and then the fish will just hold there because they don't really have to extend it, expend any any energy really to sit there. You know, they'll flip a fin, fin or two every once in a while, but really, truthfully, they're just kind of keeping their balance, you know, just chilling. But depth, I think, is important when fishing a hole, definitely. And, uh, and I've said this, I don't know, thousands of times. Every time I do a presentation, I say this. If you're going out for a fun day of fishing and you don't want to work real hard and you get to a hole or you get to a run, at the very minimum, if you don't do anything else, I don't care if you're fishing for, like you said, just for a couple of hours, or you're going to be there all day and you just decide, I'm going to park in this hole right here and I'm going to fish it. At the very minimum, 
change the depth of your fly yeah. if you're fishing nymphs. If you're fishing dries, it doesn't matter. Streamers matters a little bit more of depth. But if you're if you're nymph fishing under an indicator or if you're Euro nymphing too, change that depth because those fish are holding at different levels. They're not all stuck to the bottom all the time, although I would say that I have a tendency to fish more toward the bottom. They're they're at all levels in the water. You know, and fish that leading edge, definitely. Definitely fish that. And and I would say fish that, fish down a little and come back to that leading edge too and drop that fly off into that hole. Those are some of the quick things of, you know, the, the bigger fish are going to get the best lie. And then there's there's lots of different lies in the holes. I think another thing that, that people don't really pick out, this is what I see day to day, day in, day out. I get, where do you want me to throw? Uh, throwing that current seam over there. And people struggle picking that out in a hole. If you if I say throwing that current seam, they're, they're hunting it down. And, and they may or may not see it. And there may be four out there, you know, and I'm pointing toward one. And they're not seeing the one, and, and normally it's going to be the bigger one to start out with. So I think that's a force of habit. Really observing that hole, is a, it's critical, it's important, and we don't do it enough, I don't think. I don't do it even as much as I should. And I, I, yeah. I'm focused on reading the water and presentation. Moving downstream, if, if, so to speak, in this, or virtual tailwater, runs can be very productive spots to fish. A couple things there. Runs are never straight down the river, hardly ever. Uh, matter of fact, the riverbed hardly ever goes straight, if you think about it. Even on a straight, what looks to be a straight section of river, the, the current's bouncing from, from left to right. It's always going downstream, naturally, because that's the way water and other things flow. But it'll bounce off of things, like it'll bounce off a tree and go right. It'll bounce off the edge and start back left. It'll bounce off a rock and start back right. It'll it'll hit a rock and split and come back together. So that current's always doing something different. So in a run, you really have to be careful about how you approach it. That's the big thing. Again, read that water a little bit. So I've got a funny story here. And this didn't happen on a tailwater, but if it didn't show the the importance of of observation observations of observating, there's a new word of uh <laughs> <laughs> I've been observating yeah, for years. Right. I'm an observator, <laughs> but it, it shows the importance of observing the the run you're going to fish. So I was at Teleco with a friend, and he fishes army style. <laughs> like I've never seen a person that can cover as many miles of stream as he can cover in a day. Yeah. By lunch, he's probably he's two miles up the road at Teleco, and that's a long way. But he's just he's dabbing the whole way, and I get it. And I and I. I love to fish that way too, and I love to slow down. He's he's a hundred percent full out. Anyway, I'm I I thought well I'm gonna get it. This is what I was taught. Pat taught me. My, the guy that taught me. He said, hey, when you get up there, just get up somewhere of, of some height and just look look at the run that you're gonna fish and see what the current's doing. Understand it before you ever go down to fish it and start at the bottom and work your way up because it's a mountain stream over there. I was like, okay, I still hold that theory today pretty close to to the way that I fish. Just is as I float in there, I try to try to figure out all right what what's new. You know, it's never the same old place. So anyway, I'm sitting yeah. up on the riverbank. I'm probably, Dan, I'm probably 10 foot up. I'm up on the edge of the bank, sitting on a rock. And I see him coming out of the corner of my eye from the downstream. And I'm thinking, okay, well, he's going to see me up here. He d- he sees me. He walks right into the run and just starts fishing the crap out of it. <laughs> I was like, dang it, man. And he looks up at me. He goes, well, what the hell are you doing up there? And I, s- I said, well, I was just uh, looking at the current. And he just busted on, you know, covered another mile and a half before lunch but <laughs> i say that to say that he didn't catch anything out of there and there were fish rising before he marched in there i mean he he he, he marched in there army style you know left right left right mm-hmm. he hit every inch of it and had some great drifts but he didn't get in there and really observe what was going on and, and strategically think here's how i'm going to approach this and and i think yeah. that hurt yeah look at how people position themselves whenever they themselves whenever they go in and fish a run many many times they'll be right where well, i caught a fish right where they're standing the other day you know and maybe they fished their way in maybe they didn't but you should always plan to fish the place that you're going to stand before you stand there always and you know what sometimes you'll catch a fish sometimes you won't sometimes you'll be surprised at what's laying right there where you were planning on standing a lot of times it'll be something really really good unless somebody stood there before you oh I, and the runs and tailwaters that the current can narrow but the section could be quite wide mm-hmm. and i said earlier that it narrows that's not right it, it actually can be a long or a wide feature of the river, the, the section between shoals. And that current could be you, you down the middle. It could wind around us. You could bounce off a tree or bounce off a rock. 
So it's just another point to make as, you, as you're walking into those sections, especially if you're a wading fisherman, that could vary quite a bit. And what looks to be, at least again, on the surface, a fairly nondescript section of the river, just a long straight stretch that could have a whole lot of unique features that you could just stomp right through in order to go to find the uh, I know the currents out there some are right in the middle probably so I'll just walk out there and that's where the fish will be you could have just walked right over the best holding spots for all the absolutely fish. how many times have we walked into to rivers too on a bright sunny day and seen fish oh. scatter as you yeah. walk in yeah 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 <laughs> and they were right yeah. there wow dang I should have fished there I don't know how many times I've said that a bunch yeah, yeah. and I mean that's just that doesn't mean that if you don't do it you're not a good fisherman either you know, I'm not a good angler because yeah. I didn't fish where I was going to stand. It's just another opportunity to catch a fish really is what it is. Yeah, yeah. Try different techniques that work for you. And, and the more opportunities you have, the more fish you're going to eventually are going to catch. Yeah, definitely. So I think another thing is when you're working a run, especially with a nymph, a streamer, same way, but especially with a nymph is to, to give that fly just a little bit of a set at the end of the swing. And I try to, I've been trying to let the fly swing out of the current, right? If I'm If I'm anchored up and we're fishing a run, I try to get them to get folks to let the fly, you know, get your drift, do all that. Don't pick up the fly while it's still in the run. Eventually, you're going to move there. If you're floating downstream, you're going to move there. If you're waiting upstream, you've already been there. But let it swing out of the current before you pick it up and cast again and set up for the next drift. And I say that because I've noticed that, let's say you get to a 45-degree angle and you decide, all right, it's time for me to recast. Whenever that, whenever that indicator, whenever that fly a lot of times comes up out of the water, it makes a big pop. It almost sounds like a light bulb exploding. And I just wonder, yeah. what does that sound like underwater? I bet it's pretty dang loud. Yeah. Let it slide out of the current a little bit before you pick it up. And that way you don't have quite as much force. Maybe it doesn't make quite as much of a of a pop. You know, maybe it's a little softer. Maybe that keeps the fish in tune. Maybe they don't get up, you know, get on their edge and say, oh, wait a minute, I'm, I'm all ears now. I, I think I've accidentally done that a bunch, too. Well, certainly the popping part, but I'm talk about just letting it run all the way out through a you know, if you're, you're waiting and you're nymphing and you've gone through a pretty long stretch to let it go all the way down, your, your fly will tend to swing up in the water column too, which can, at least for me, can trigger a strike at times. It's like an emerger coming uh -huh. up and they'll hit it. And sometimes very violently right. hit it. So it's just another reason, just because you drifted down a long way, doesn't mean just you instantly pop the thing out of the water and do the drift again. Give it some patience because the end of that drift could be the most critical part in the whole thing. I mean, really, if you think about it, if, if you tie a soft tackle on a, you know, maybe 12 inches off of a, a heavy nymph on that swing, that soft mm -hmm. tackle starts swinging up. That's a, that's, that works. It's a trigger. Yeah. That definitely works. Yep. Again, a run, I'm going to look for objects floating on the water to give me a hint of how fast is the current flow in there uh, and I want to try to make that indicator go you know about that same speed slower is better if I have a, a leaf that's floating I'd rather it pass my indicator than my indicator pass the leaf is probably an easy way to put it so a slower drift is far far better for me than a faster one if you figure out your currents in that run before you get in there and start fishing it your first two or three casts are going to be better than if you don't figure them out right you're going to be able to put your fly right where it needs to be i think another thing that you, you look at is is as is they come out as the water comes out of that run uh and attached to that run some, sometimes there are gravel bars in middle tennessee there are a lot of gravel bars we fish those hard so let's let's describe a gravel bar for folks it's a rise in the river bottom normally it's gravel why we call it a gravel bar pretty dang smart huh talk about observations <laughs> and it's running parallel with the river so a shoal is running, like we said last time, shoal's running across the river. Uh, gravel bar, we're going to say, is running parallel or with the current, right? So it, you'll see these long gravel bars. I can think of one on one of the one of the tailwaters here that's probably almost a football field long, this gravel bar. And it's not deep. You know, the, the, edge, the, the edge of it down to the where the long hole is, basically, it's kind of a runnish hole. It's not deep. It's probably two or three feet. But, man, I mean, the fish hold there like nobody's business and it just nobody fishes it nobody fishes the edge of that everybody goes over to the wall <laughs> there's a wall on the other mm -hmm. side everybody fishes that wall and a few of us will tie on a, a, a light nymph so no bead no nothing or midge generally a very small light midge and fish that that the, the edge of that gravel bar we fish it very much i think the way that we would fish a shoal and that we're looking for different depths within it and different contours as far as it's it's not running it's not like you look down a wall 
it's like you look down a mountainside and there's little things sticking out, you know, little little pieces of mountain sticking out, if you will. And that's just the way that the, the waters form that gravel bar. Up next to that gravel bar, and I know that you you like to fish this too, there are a lot of fish that lean up against that gravel bar. And like I say, they're, they're sitting there drinking a milkshake, waiting on something to float by that they can eat. Yeah, it's another feeding zone for them. And it's typically, when you see them like you've described, they're, they're maybe in a stretch of water that doesn't, if, the, if not for the gravel bar, there wouldn't be a whole lot of structure midstream if you're finding any any type of hiding spots it would be on the edges of it um you mentioned that you know having a gravel bar right next to a big cliff face and everybody fishes that deep water over there that's kind of an obvious spot to look for the gravel bars a lot of times can be big, real subtle spots but they can also hold some really big fish and good fish and one of the reasons is it could be an area that they're uh, a bigger fish is using to rest in between feeding periods so you know i think of that to me starts thinking streamer fishing and <laughs> potentially uh, nymphing of course too but typically if you can find a fish like that you might be able to trigger a strike david talk a little bit about this because there may be some confusion when you talk gravel bars a lot of times if you especially at low water if you're walking a, a stream including the tailwater you'll find gravel on the inside bends of, mm. of bends in the river which i know we're about to talk yeah. about what we're talking about here is more about structure that it could be mid stream and running like you said running the length of the river so by nature of it it's going to have and everybody can see my yes, hands here yes it could have some con <laughs> have some contours to it and those contours those edges are typically where you're going to find fish that are feeding and waiting for a meal to come to them yeah. is that how you view it yeah exactly current running down the edges or the uh, the slope of that gravel bar is is a prime target don't just wait in there and fish it fish before you walk in yeah because this is this is a critical spot that you can catch a lot of fish and you can you can walk up to and, and i'm back on the same gravel bar that i was on before that's very long with some contours you know in and out to the sides to the sloping sides of it you can stand you can walk up to that thing and stand there for five minutes and i guarantee you right now there's five fish rising within five minutes big nice fat fish because they're just sitting there mm -hmm. eating all day until somebody walks on their head and then they're you know then they slide off yeah but that's the problem there could be five anglers standing right where they are yeah. too because that that you're right it, it's an enticing spot as as a waiter to stand because yeah. you're, you're thinking okay so it's gravel i i know where i can scurry out of there quickly to get the shallow water if i need to and typically we'll go right to the deepest part rather than uh, realize that that it's that contour that transition from shallow once it starts to move toward deeper water that typically you'll find the fish guarantee you there's somebody out there right now saying oh, i've never caught a fish like that off the side of a gravel bar guarantee 100 percent. yeah but yeah. i say i say they shouldn't try it i wouldn't do it if i were them if I was everybody else, I would. But if I was that person, I would not try it. <laughs> and you talked about bends inside and outside of bends are good places. In that inside bends, a lot of times you'll find these big heaping, great big mounds of gravel, you know, after a big generation, big rain events, lots of generation, builds those inside gravel bars up. And on higher water, you know, not too high. But higher water, if you can get to the leading edge of one of those big gravel bars, it, it's almost like a shoal that sticks out in a way. It's a big mound. You'll find these big mounds of loose gravel, and we can float up to them and swing streamers over them on high water. If you can, if you can hit that just right, it's like swinging a streamer over, over the front edge of a hole. It's just, it's amazing the number of fish that go into those those places like right away. You know, like right after a big event. It goes down, you're like, hey, there's a big gravel bar. The next time you come through there, it's a higher water. If you can remember to fish it, there are a ton of fish that go in there and sit on high water because it breaks the, obviously it breaks the water. The turbidity is not quite as much right there. <laughs> the turbidity. <laughs> By the way, what Dave is referring to is in part one, I misused the word turbidity too many times and uh, turbidity means uh, clouded water typically so not the turbulent water that I was referring to so for my English professor who may be watching this podcast sorry <laughs> <laughs> I pronounced it right <laughs> yes yes you did yes you did you were looking for turbulence I could see you so we're doing this on Zoom. I was. I was searching for the word and I came up with it. Yeah, turbidity, turbidity came out and I was like, man, this is going to be perfect because I can jump on this and I can keep this going. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to get a t-shirt that for you that says turbidity. Yeah. I look forward to all the, you'll, oh, you'll get all the emails that are correct. Yes, I will. I won't pass them along. <laughs> yeah. I don't need the email. We know what we were doing. We, we, we both, and I think he knew, I think you knew right away. As soon as it came out, I could see it. You were like, oh, yeah, he's going to yeah. use this against me. <laughs> yeah. 
Uh, as soon as it was all done, I was like, oh, I blew that one. But that was an hour worth of taping. I'm not going to ask David to re-record it because I was an idiot. I, I would have done it, but it would just. I think that it. I think that it made the episode. I really do. Hey, th- this is not easy stuff we're doing here. This podcast stuff. It's not for everybody. No, it's not. Let's go back to bins. So we talked about that gravel bar on the inside of the bin. I mean, if you think about the the number of named bins on rivers, like yeah. the bin pool on the elk. I mean, that's if you fish in Middle Tennessee, you know exactly where that is. There's Big Bend on the Hiawassee, Blevins Bend on the Watauga, where cows walk on water on the Caney Fork, and then there's a and and you're you're more of a little red river guy than i am but there's a bend at john's pocket on the little red right there is it's got a name for it and if i could if i had my book in front of me i'd tell you what it was there are a lot of bends and fish a hole in these pools that are created when the current goes around these bends i think that as that current slows on the inside of that bend that's a really good spot for resting fish obviously but most people go to the outside of the bend and they fish the crap out of it and I just wonder, you know, did they drop their anchor on the inside of the bin right on that fish's head? Did they wade in without fishing first? You know, have I rushed up to a bin? Yes. And fished, fished the crap out of it and not caught anything on the outside bin? Absolutely. Dis- dissecting that bend and fishing it thoroughly, if you can get into it, it's a, it's a hot spot. Bins are just hot spots for people to, to go into and, and, and fish. They are. It's hard to pass up the outside Part of a bend in the tailwaters that we fish, David, the outside of a bend is going to have structure, visible structure that as the it's in all of us as fishermen, you're going to gravitate to the trees, to the things that you can see poking out of the water. They just look fishy and, and they do hold fish through fishing with you and, and through trial and error that a lot of times it looks really good. It also gets a lot of pressure from other anglers. And typically you find a lot of fish on the inside part of the bin, as opposed to that outside bin, even though uh, the inside bin, like it may be gravel and structure, it's not holding a lot of visible, you know, there's a stump or a tree or a big boulder. That's all in the outside bin, just by the nature of the river. I've also found in the inside of bins, it kind of gets to that gravel feature we were talking about. It's like a washout hole that's on the back side of that. They can get quite deep. If you're wading, it's another thing that you have to kind of watch for, especially if you're wading gravel on the inside bend of a river. If it's gravel, be careful with your footing there because it can slip off into some deep water fairly quickly. That's speaking from experience. Yes. <laughs> Leaves are a big thing that stick in there too. You'll look and see, oh, the bottom, it's not very deep here, but it may be four foot of leaves stacked up in there that are just completely oh, yeah. fool you into thinking that you're going to step into a, a real solid place, but it's a metric ton of leaves. I'll find that in, in the stones that, um, after that one, you know, once it gets a little bit warmer and I start wading again back through there, you find these deposits of leaves that are, you know, came, that fell in the fall, they get caught up in the current and they settled into those inside bins behind gravel bars. And you're exactly right. Your walk through what looks to be two feet of water and it's actually six feet because it's full of dead leaves so yeah exactly i think that soft water inside of the bend it's a good place to provoke those resting fish right they're they're again yeah leaned up against that that gravel bar or leaned up against something drinking that milkshake waiting on something to come by i think the outside of the bend is just nine times out of ten in our mind it's super sexy right uh, this is this has got this has to be where where the fish are and i'm not saying that it's not because we know that they're there because it has the four things, oxygen, food, protection, a little bit cooler water. Don't overlook the inside of the bin is really what I'm saying here. And I think he would work that inside bin every three to f- three to five feet, you know, really cover it before you ever step in there. If you're working it with a streamer, the inside of the bin, this really goes for anywhere. A couple of years ago, Jim, a friend of ours, was fishing with us, and, and we were fishing during the spring, so we were fishing a lot of streamers and early spring and he he would get a hit and and it takes forever to to train yourself to not set the hook like you would on a nymph if you're fishing a streamer so i've said this a million times if i said it once to myself too don't set the hook just keep on stripping and you'll get these short strikes and if you keep stripping the fly's still in their face and it's still in a good place for them to eat it. If you set like a like a trout set, the fly normally is going to advance 10 foot or com- pl- come completely out of the water, one of the two. But if you can train yourself or get yourself, it's and it's not easy, to keep on stripping, you'll keep that fly in the zone, and you'll get another shot at that fish. The key there, and this is inside of bends, but it's also... It's it's anywhere. If you get a if you get a hit on a streamer and you can keep your rod tip down and you can keep stripping, you can give it three or four real short, 
you know, two inch wrist strips real short and then stop the fly. And when you stop that fly, you can get a really hard hit right there. Like they'll think, oh, I wounded it. It tried to take off and then it stopped. It's dead. It's an easy one. That's a great tip. It works, but it's so hard to do. It's almost, it feels like it's impossible to do. It's not, but it feels that way because we're we're all taught from the time that we're old enough to hold any type of fishing rod. It seems like it's, you know, if you get a hit, set the hook i don't know that's just that's a that's an inside that's worked on the. i guess the reason why i said that is because it's worked on the inside of ben several times for us and that's what it came back to my mind at that point that that that's a good tactic that i know works on the inside of Ben's. i know it works everywhere else too but i've seen it work really good in, in that situation more than once yep that's a good one keep your rod tip down get a hit do your best not to lift the rod tip crazy as that is if you're fishing yep. a streamer point it at the fish almost yeah i don't know that's the inside of bins and the, the gravel bars on the inside of bins i think is a big big structure piece and, and, and you know, just kind of moving through, we've gone through a bunch of different parts of a stream that you can find on any stream, not just the tailwater with going for the gravel bars, the shoals and go back to the part one, the riffles, the aspects of, of, a, of a run, even the inside and outside bend. But one thing that, that is a little bit more unique with tailwaters is what we call riprap, which I know is one of the things that mm. you like a, a lot as a, as a guide and as a Absolutely. fisherman. It can, be, it can be one of the best places is for you to it, it is obvious structure what we're talking about rip wrap is typically the rock that it's often brought in by whoever built the dam. You find it in, you know, the areas of erosion to downstream, but typically it's below, right below a dam. You'll find a lot of it. it. It is to prevent erosion. They build it up there on one side of the riverbed, particularly right below where the, the, the they generate most frequently below the dam. Man-made, it's a pile of rock. Also a fantastic, as a byproduct, a fantastic place to fish. It provides current breaks. It provides oxygen, provides food for the fish. Look for an obvious place to fish fish riprap is one of those best places i think the thing about riprap for me is is that it's there's a lot of contours there fish can tuck between some rocks or up next to some rocks and get that safety that they need here's something that i think that i realized i remember the day i realized it i remember the fish i caught when i realized it i remember the 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 fly i was using i remember who was on the boat with me i remember all of it but on that day i realized that i threw up on on falling water and I and I threw a, a streamer up to the riprap and just worked it down. Like I worked it super, super slow. S- heavy sinking line, light fly. And I worked it down the contour of that riprap. So when they dump that out of those, those dump trucks, that rock, into the river, it's not going to form a perfect wall. It never does. It can't. Because they're not stacking it. They're just backing a dump truck up and dumping it in there. And the only reason it's there is because there's current going through there and it's chewing that bank away. So they'll throw these rocks in there to slow that current down and keep that current off of that dirt. You'll find it next to roads a lot of times. Or you'll find a break where it's where they think, okay, we're going to have a potential problem here. So we'll build a little dike uh, and we'll shoot that current back across the, the river up against something that's maybe a little harder or maybe it's you know a little got a little bit different contour to the riverbed so that it's not really eroding that bank that's there because there is so much water current coming through there and that current goes back to those four things that we talk about right that protection it's there it's there from the rocks it's there from the extra current that goes across there too that food is going to run across there. They can lean up, lean into those rocks. There's some oxygen coming out. If it, for some reason, all of a sudden becomes hard to breathe, they just duck out of those rocks into that current and, and take in some oxygen. Same, t- same time, take in some food. Same time, current is normally going to cool that water down a little bit. I think that's why I like it because it's got those four things. Again, I don't know that I really realized that's what I was doing until recently, but it's got those four things. That riprap has those four things. It's there because the current's there. Otherwise, there would be no reason to put it there. So that's kind of, that's elementary. It sounds elementary. But if you look at where it's placed, a lot of times it's placed by a road. Sometimes it's there exclusively for the road because the road would wash out if they didn't have it there. For the ones that that listen to the podcast, I hope that you can get to some of that and fish it. And I hope you have a whole lot of luck. Depending on your your tailwater, the riprap that may be right below a dam, it's a food source too. There's stuff in the rocks that, you know, your whole food chain's going on there, depending on how long that riprap's been there too uh, there's a lot of striped fish that tend to hang out through there too so yeah they're trying to trying to get their fill of what may be hiding behind those rocks but mainly from a from a trout perspective especially at high water it's just there they're it's a great place for them to get out of the current 
and still be able to get grab meal. I think about the the like the mink, even the otters uh, that that will hang out on that riprap on low water, yeah. and they'll they'll go in and grab something, whatever, small fish, whatever. Birds, same thing. They'll I, I mean herons will stand there. You know how herons are; they stand there super yeah. still forever, and then the next thing you know, they're grabbing out something. So there'll be fish on those with low water when the high water comes up they'll wash out of there so there's yeah probably a little bit of food that comes in there worms bugs grasshoppers you know trying to work their way through there and get washed in and there's just a there are a lot of things that, yeah. that use that riprap for a highway for a <laughs> for a kitchen table yeah i could do a whole podcast probably on this riprap on this one subject yeah there's nothing like standing there and just looking taking some time and watching you'd be surprised at what goes on, on on these sections of river around the riprap. And sometimes that riprap is, is really big. If it's around, if it's around railroad bridge or something like a trestle or something like that, a lot of times those rocks might be a little bit bigger. I don't know why. There's, I'm yeah. sure there's a reason why maybe they they cost less or whatever. And they're easier to get in on a railroad car or something, but whatever the reason is, there's a lot of, t- sometimes there's different size rocks too. It's not for every situation, but most of the riprap I know of, it's a little tough to wade through there. It's typically around deeper water. So it may be, something that'd be better off from the boat especially if you're yep. fishing high water anyway it's yeah, a little safer to I do agree. it that way well geez i think we slowed this one down just a little bit uh which i think is better or we, we could do a part three <laughs> yeah still observing <laughs> <laughs> i think there was some theory in there but i would say a, a large very large percentage of it is what we've observed definitely what i've observed are we right about all this i don't know time will tell if you're listening to this and you just and you and you can get into 30 percent of it just a small percentage of it and try it you'll find something in here that we've said on, on this episode that that you can use and that'll work for you i am convinced of that it's all about trying different things i don't know how many different things i've tried i think about some of the flies that i've the patterns that i've thought man this is gonna work then it looks just like whatever and then you throw it and it doesn't work well this some of this stuff is going to be that way it it may not work where you're fishing but i guarantee you if you listen to it and put some of it into practice you're going to find something that that you're going to hit on that you're going to be satisfied with I'd say that we'll call them hypothesis. It's a big word for a little mind. They're proven out true for me day in, day in, day out. I know that that a lot of them have proved out true for you as well. Even on the stones, I'm sure that you've used some of this on the stones, and it's not a tailwater. It's it's a freestone, but the principles are very, very similar, very much the same. Well, I've learned things. There's things you've talked about today that I'm definitely going to try, and uh, and things you talked about in in, uh, part one on this, that you're right, they're applicable to to the stones or any other river out there. You're going to have have some of the same river features that we've talked about. And as we've dissected some of these areas, you talked about where fish will most likely hang out and feed. And I think that's fairly consistent from river to river. It's not just with the tailwaters, but these are, you know, obvi- obviously these are things that are you, you'll find with most, if not all, tailwaters in the southeast, and they, they're they're applications of some experience that you've had and we've had. I mean, you've had a lot of a lot of good experiences, and you've shared some some interesting things sure. as well yeah. that I think are are very useful, uh, and done a really good job of of explaining what you were talking about, probably better than me in a lot of situations, except for turbidity. Which yeah, we cleared we cleared that up though. So we talked about turbidity just a little bit, tailwater fluctuation and scouting and fishing holes and runs and gravel bars and bends and, and riprap. We gave folks some pro tips. Uh, and what I'm hoping is that they'll learn from it and put that knowledge into practice. And and that practice that I'm talking about really can be fun. Uh, that's, you know, doing things, tweaking tweaking your approach just a little bit differently. Uh, always, always work on your presentation, and I, I that that saves the day. I mean, I see people that change flies fifteen times, and people say, "Well, what'd you use today?" Well, it's the same thing. I use one fly, one nymph, all the way down the river, you know, eleven miles, eleven miles with one nymph, and I see people changing eleven and twelve times. You know, they've got four and five flies hanging off their off their uh, off their tippet. Not that that's a bad thing. That's just not how I choose to do it. I really, really have people focus on presentation more than anything else. All of this stuff is great, but it really works when you put it together with a good presentation. 
I think just remembering that every situation is just a little bit different. This is the the age old, it's tired. It's a tired saying that you never stay, step in the same river twice. I believe that's true. Although the, the saying is getting tired, I'm tired of reading it, I'm tired of hearing people talk about it. It is true. You really don't ever step in the same river twice. Something about it is different. Maybe not completely different, but there's something different each time you step in there. Golly, I just this this was a fast hour. I mean, these things go fast anyway. But yeah, I appreciate you coming in and kind of keeping this thing going. I mean, you really have kept us on task. I appreciate you doing that. Is there anything else you'd like to add that that maybe we've we've left out? You want to go back and hit anything? Thank you again for for inviting me to be a part of it. it it's been a ton of fun for me, and and I hope it it's been enjoyable. To- to the listeners and watchers. If anything, we, we've talked about thinking through some of this stuff and, and that a lot of times when we go fishing and everybody has the reasons to go fishing, and often it's, it's an escape for us. And um, in the world we've been living in for the last year, yeah, it could be a big escape just to get out and get your mind off of things. And from that standpoint, it may just be relaxing for you to go fishing. But if you think about some of the things that we've, we've talked about, and and the different observations that we've recommended, if you apply that, and it it requires some thinking, certainly, you'll have better success, I think, in terms of fishing or catching fish too. So I I certainly wish the best for everybody. Everybody stay healthy and uh, stay safe, and and I hope to see you on the river soon. If you didn't have a website, if you weren't painting and all that, I I know that you would still come on here and do this. Oh, yeah. But if you get a chance to go to Dan's website, it's dancharley.com, and just look at his paintings. He's got some really good stuff out there. I mean, it, and I'm not just saying that because he's Thank a friend you. of mine. It is good stuff. I know because I've got a bunch of it. Stop by and just cruise his website, dancharley.com. You can find him there. He's got a blog. Again, he wrote Whiskey River. If you can find that, look up Dan Charley Whiskey River. If you haven't read that, that needs to be something that you read. That was an observation on the tailwater, Davis. <laughs> <laughs> True story. Heck of an observation. <laughs> You can find Southeastern Fly at southeasternfly.com. If you haven't subscribed to the podcast, make it easy on yourself and let Siri do the do all the work. Or just hit the subscribe button on any of the podcatchers that you listen to. You can follow us on southeasternfly.com, Facebook, Instagram, or like I said, that Fly Fishing Podcast at Southeastern Fly is a Facebook group. That's got some a little bit different information. We run some polls in there, and that kind of guides this podcast, actually. To all y'all listening out there, I do appreciate it. And we'll see you next time on Southeastern Fly. See you, everybody. that one went a little bit better yeah it did feel better, it felt better. the first one felt like like i said give him a drink through through a fire hose but a lot of information there's a lot of information there too but i don't know it, it flew by this time the first time not that it went slow it just seemed a lot longer mainly because it was it was heavy with information so do you know it's uh diarrhea diarrhea awareness week it runs till friday <laughs> goes goes right along with the jokes you've been sending through text. Uh, 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 I don't know if anybody even appreciates them, but I do. I can't see you. Uh, video, video, video. Yeah, start the video. Yep, can you see now. Look just the same as the other day. Did you change clothes? Are you taking a shower? No, not at all. It's Saturday. Saturday is the shower day. <laughs>